lift up your praises because you are worthy. So remind us of all, all you've done today. Remind us of the life we have because of you. And let us not just stay with our mouths that we are yours, but to live that way that we walk out of here. Would you change us in this moment? Would you radically change us? Turn our hearts toward you. In the name of Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. Good morning. I like it when they turn the lights on. Got two two small announcements before we begin anything or before we go into our giving. Uh, tomorrow starts Vacation Bible School. Now there's a little insert inside your bulletin that you can read and uh, that'll give you all the information you need towards Vacation Bible School. Also, on July the 9th, there's a, a ladies' meeting is entitled Simply Living as His from 1 till 4 o'clock in the small auditorium next door over here. And over the next two weeks, you ladies can write down any question that you want to and put it in a little clamshell on the table out, into, out in the uh, foyer. I made fun this morning in the first service saying that Sherry would probably write and put in there, what the heck is wrong with Martin, you know, so... I think you can be as blunt and as honest as you need to be. So, huh? <laughs> I think everyone should put that one in there because half the time I don't even know myself what's wrong with me. However, we're gonna. I've got something that I want to show you that I think is very unique, and she's right. Our pastor Steve is back. He's been gone for three weeks. And she's also right that it uh, did kind of hurt my feelings a little bit because I was one of the speakers. And in the first service, she made such a huge deal about him being back as if, you know, we didn't really do a good job. So anyway, I take it off, off my shoulders. But while Steve was gone, he did learn to do something. So I want to share that with you before we go any farther, just so that you'll see he didn't waste his time in the mountains of North Carolina. Now, he says this is not while he was in the mountains. This was before he left. I think that, yeah, okay, whatever. There it is. Show it to him, Mike. Yeah, you can clap. <laughs> we, Jonathan sent that to me three weeks ago, and I, I was do. I wanted so bad to play it then, but Bob and them wouldn't let me do it. They they voted me down. They want to wait till you came back. But uh, it is it's it's hilarious. Granted, the, uh, remember this: he will not be on Dancing with the Stars. I don't think that's going to happen. So, getting to the talk, we're we're talking about giving. And I've got a scripture that's found in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 9 says, As it is written, They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. This is out of the same chapter where it talks about giving with a cheerful heart. Now, giving to me is something that God just allows us to do. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should never perish, not perish, not suffer, but have everlasting life. So to me, giving is just a natural response of gratitude toward a God who loves us. Now, there's two types of giving. There's paying your bills giving. You know, if you, if you don't pay your electric, electric bill, what happens? Oh, yeah, they, or they turn them off. <laughs> You don't pay your house payment, what happens? They kick you out. You don't pay your car payment, you're going to walk or ride a bicycle. There's just payments. But here's the deal with this. This is giving. If you want to do something good for your wife, you give her something. If you want to do something good for a neighbor, you give them something. 
That's the kind of gift this is talking about. A gift to the poor that's given out of our heart of gratitude towards what God has done for us. That is giving. That's all that matters. Nothing else. Giving out of your heart. So would you ushers come forth, please? You remember one time I talked about how that I was at a church service and they put the, uh, the, the guys down here with one plate and everyone stood up and they were raving their money in the air. And if you'll remember, I talked about how that I gave my 120 I had a $20 bill in my pocket. I gave it the first time, not recognizing the fact that they were going to do this twice. So the next time that, that they did it the second time was for another reason, but I'd already given all I had, so all I had left, well, I did have a little bit. I had a quarter in my pocket. So I held up my quarter, and I went up there and gave it. Did you know that they told me that you wouldn't believe how many quarters we got on that Sunday when I told that? So if you only got a quarter, give your quarter. But give it with a joyful heart. Proverbs seventeen twenty two. A cheerful heart is good medicine. So do what you do cheerfully. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I'm grateful, God, that you love us back and that you take care of us in every way. God, I've never given that you didn't take care of me. And when David said, I, I once was young, but now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging for bread, that basically means you always take care of us. So we give to honor you and to help other people with gifts that you've given us to give to them. God bless this offering. Bless these folks that are giving as we give with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good to be home. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, although I'm not real wild about the heat, okay? Uh, we left North Carolina, the mountains of North Carolina Monday morning. It was 50 degrees. And uh, it wasn't that yesterday. So uh, <laughs> maybe twice that plus. Um, and, and I just want to, I didn't do this with the first service. God let me do something else. But um, I just want to tell you thank you to the leaders of this church, 
and to you folks for allowing me and my wife and family. First week was a week with my family, and we had 17 of us, and it was quite a time. Uh, but then the next week we fasted and just prayed, and and God showed up in ways that I don't even... You know, sometimes when God shows up in my life, I don't know how to verbalize it. I don't know how to talk about it. And so I have to ask him every week, you know, give me the words to say. And he kind of wrecked me a few times and then resurrected me and wrecked me some more. And, and uh, by the way, Jim, I want to tell you this, that you had given me some CD, I mean, some DVDs. And man, that was kind of part of our teaching. It was incredible teaching uh, by the guy, uh, Rob Mastin or something, I think his name. It was just, yeah, just incredible teaching. And God just did so many things in my life and heart. And so I want to thank you for that. Um, but I really believe that, that God, you know, kind of wrecks us and messes us up. And then he, he gets us in a position where we learn how to trust him. We learn how to have faith in him. And, you know, when we use this term faith, I, think, I don't think we use it appropriately. I think sometimes... You know, have you ever heard about people who go to, you know, faith healing services? When they go to faith, faith healing services, whoever was supposed to go to get healed didn't get healed. And the faith healer, uh, in his frustration, looks and says, well, you just didn't have enough faith. And that, that um, brings to us the thought that, uh, that faith is something we conjure up. <laughs> A faith is something that we, that we have to, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, you know, just kind of grunt real hard and it comes, you know. And it's not that. Faith is not that at all. Some people say, well, faith is about what I believe. Well, it is about what you believe, but it's not just that. Or some people say, faith is about what I do. And it is, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, works, the word and works come, but they're a result of the faith. They don't cause the faith. The faith that you have to trust God, let me just say this if you've never thought about this, comes from God. God gives you the ability to have faith. Now, hey, let me tell you what faith means. The, the Greek word is pistis, and it simply means uh, to, to, to trust or to rely on God's character. And that's hard to do sometimes. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you just didn't know what to do, and so you did something else? You know, you worked harder, you worked, you worked more diligently, and because you worked harder and you worked more diligent, you thought that the faith would become stronger, but it didn't, you just got wore out. Ever happened to you? Um, faith is not about doing more. It's not about knowing more. It's not about what I do, and it's not about what I don't do. It's about what God does through you. And that's so important for us to understand. When we look at the book of James, uh, James was accused, by the way, of being kind of at odds with Paul and that his, that his message was about you know, works and Paul's message was about grace. But when you read the book of James and when you, when you look at the context and when you look at what James was trying to say to these, these believers who had been scattered, many of them because of persecution, uh, and they were trying to figure out how to live their life. And they were trying to figure out how to get through the persecution, how to get through the difficult times. And they were trying to understand what James says when he says, the trying of your faith work is, works patience or perseverance. They were trying to figure out how do we live. And sometimes, even though we may not be going through the persecution, we go through the same thing, don't we? How do we take this thing called faith and really put it into practice? And let me tell you what the word faith is, is basically equal with. The word surrender. Because faith is simply saying this. I rely on the character of God. Therefore, I obey the word of God. I obey the word of God in its written form. I obey the word of God as the Holy Spirit begins to speak to me and lead me and guide me. And what we're going to find in our study uh, this morning is we're going to find that, that real faith, that real faith is not something that, again, I conjure up or that I do, but it's something that's done in 
and through me. And we're gonna we're going to uh, you know look at that and see you know what God wants to do. But before before I do, I want to share something with you that I've shared with you before. It's kind of a process that we kind of live on and we stand on. And 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 the sad thing about this is that even followers of Christ, even believers, that they live this way. And when they live this way, they get very, very, very frustrated. And maybe you're one of them. And let me share with you what it means. What, what I mean. What I mean is that when when we come before God or when we come before ourselves and we and we and there's there's some deep needs that God is, you know, infused with every one of us. One of those deep needs is to feel worthy, that I'm worth something, that I have value. We, we just kind of want that. And then the other one is, which is kind of akin to it, is that we have a sense of belonging. You know, the, that, that drives about everything we do. Did you know that? The reason you go, you, you find a certain kind of a, a work. In fact, I've heard this said by like professional athletes who, who are, you know, playing football or something. They'll, they'll look back and they won't say, I remember all the Super Bowl wins. I remember all the touchdowns. They say, I just remember the sense of belonging the sense of connecting. And we all are made with that. Well, that's kind of implanted in our DNA. We have this sense of belonging, but how do we get that sense of belonging? We do it like we do everything else in this world. We think we can do it ourselves, right? So when I say competence, I mean, you know, what we do well, uh, things, you know, it, it can be a many different things. It can be the abilities that I have, the you know, the, the money that I have, the, the influence that I have, the accomplishments that I've done, all of these things that, you know, the way that I look, the way that I, you know, the, you know, if my parents have money, you know, or whatever, and all of these things together will say, this, this, if I do all these things, I'll get this. Does this make sense? If I do all these things, I'll have self-worth. You know, if I look good enough, I'll have self-worth. If I have enough, I'll have self-worth. If, if, um, if, if, if people like me enough, I'll have self-worth, and therefore, I belong. And that works okay as long as this is all in order. But let me tell you what happens in life. And you know this, and I know this. Not everything works out, does it? Uh, we don't always get, you know, uh, sometimes somebody works at a job and they work for many years and all of a sudden they get pink slip. And all of this comes crashing down. <sighs> Professional athletes have a problem with this because, you know, when they're, when they're, especially the superstars, you know, they make all the money and they, they're in the limelight, but when their career is ended, many of them go into deep depression. Many of them file bankruptcy because they're, they're trying to find a way to get this, which will bring this. And so, and so many of you today, one of the reason, and you're a follower of Christ, you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and one reason why you fi feel like you're, you don't fit in anywhere, you feel like you have no value in your life, is because this has come crashing down. And when Jesus Christ comes into your life, he, he tells us that this is not the way we are to live. Now here's what happens. God gives us this wonderful thing called faith. And, I, and as I said earlier, faith is relying on the character of God, believing the word of God and doing the will of God when he says do it. So God says faith will turn this around. So here's what happens when you become a believer in Jesus Christ. This is exciting. Jesus died on the cross and he shouldered your sin. He shouldered my sin. And he said, you are, Paul says this, you were bought with a price. That you're no longer your own. Here's what he says. But you are mine, basically. Your body, by the way, we, we don't uh, have a soul. We are a soul that has a body, as C.S. Lewis says. But so God comes into your soul, and he takes ownership. And he says this. You belong to me. You are no longer your own. You have been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. You no longer 
have any ownership, but I own you, but you belong to me. And here's what happens. When we understand that we belong to him, God gives us this thing called self-worth. Our worthiness is not found in ourselves and our abilities and what we have and who we're related to and how we look or any of that. Our worth is found in the fact that we belong to Jesus Christ. Now, what should be the natural outcome of that? Not competence. I've said it was before, but that's not true. The natural outpour of belonging to Christ, uh, feeling the worth that he infuses within us, is worship. So what does that mean? That means in everything that I do, I'm saying, God, you are first. God, because I belong to you and you give me value and you give me wor worth, whether I'm, whether I'm working, whether I'm cleaning my house, whether I'm paying my bills, and every area of my life needs to be the area of worship, an area of faith where, where we say this, God, I depend on you. I'm going to do what you say no matter what. I'm going to follow you no matter what. It may not look like it makes a whole lot of sense to everybody else. And quite frankly, those, of, those people who don't know Christ, they'll look at a believer who will do some, you know, practice their faith, and they'll say, that's foolish. Because the Bible says that the natural man receives not the things of God. And that, and that sometimes what believers do in their faith and trust in God looks on the surface as foolishness. But let me tell you this. Every person I've ever known who fully relied on the character and the word and the will of God, listen to me, have the peace of God and the contentment of God. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to share with you how you get there, what it really means, and use a word that maybe you hadn't heard in a long time. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to the book of James. Again, James is writing to these persecuted, scattered believers, um, Jewish believers, and he's talking about this thing called faith, and we've got to be careful not to misunderstand what faith is. Or, we'll, or, or we can misinterpret this text. So in James chapter 2, starting with verse 14, here's what he says. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters? He says he's talking to those who are followers of Christ, those who are in faith with him. He says, what good is it? He says, if someone claims, that's an important word, if they say or they claim to have faith but have no deeds. In other words, if people say I'm a follower of Christ, but there's no evidence in their lives, then, then is this, basically he's saying, is this faith real? He says, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother, and he gives us an example, he says, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. You see somebody in, in deep need, in other words. Verse 16, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, He's saying, what good is it? I mean, what good is your faith? And then he says this, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Here's what he's saying. Faith that doesn't work, faith that doesn't, that, 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 that doesn't move from the inside and work on the outside because of what God's doing in that person is, and he uses this term, dead. It's not alive. In other words, it's really non-existent. It's really non-existent. And then he says, he says, verse, verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. And he says, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you uh, my faith by my deeds. And that can be translated out of my deeds. He says, and then he, here's what he's saying. He's saying, if you say you have a faith, and nothing's changing in your life. I've got reason to question. He says, but if I'll show you my faith, and if my faith is real, it's more than just what I believe. It's more than just what I say. It's who I am. It's how I live. And notice what he says. Next. He says, he says um, you believe that there's one God. Everybody here believe that? Believe there's one God. He says, good. Would you read this next part with me? I've missed your reading. You guys are so good. Okay, here we go. 
Here we go. Right, let me find it again. Okay. Even the believe and shudder. Wow. Another translation says, even the, the demons believe and tremble. In other words, if all you do is say, I believe this, or even if in your heart you believe it, but, but you don't allow the word of God, you don't allow the will of God, you don't allow the power of God to work through you, here's what he's saying. He's saying you're on the same level as the demons. Because the demons believe. Listen, you know who knows about Jesus Christ in more detail than anybody else? They are demons. Demons, Satan. They know who he is. They understand who, what his power is. And I could go into a different text where they would say, when Jesus would show up, you know, you know, you are Jesus, the son of the living God. We know who you are. Whereas a lot of believers, sad to say, don't even really know who he is. And then he goes on to say this. this is, it gets better. He says, you foolish person, you, you do, excuse me, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless, or that could be translated dead? Verse 21, was not our father, and he uses a character. In fact, he uses two characters here that we're going to talk about. He says, was not our father, Abraham, who's the father of a Jewish nation, Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. He says, you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Let me explain what he did. Okay? And this is important to get. What did Abraham do that was accounted for him as righteousness? God came to Abraham, and here's what he told him to do. He says, Abraham, I want you to take your son Isaac. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about Isaac. First of all, it's a, it was his only son. Sarah gave birth to him when she was about 99 years old. That's, this is a miraculous son. He was a promise of God. God said, I'm going to, in your seed, in this son, I'm going to produce a brand new nation. It's going to be a nation where they will love me and follow me. There's going to be a nation that's going to be close to my heart. And so now God comes to Abraham one day and he says, Abraham, I want you to take that promised son. I want you to take your own, you know, this, this son that I've given you, and I want you to take him on the mountain, and I want you to sacrifice him. Now, that sounds absurd. And, and quite frankly, to understand Jewish law, to human sacrifices were not allowed. Okay, just so you know. And here's what Abraham did. He was willing to follow through because he, get this, he relied on the character of God. Now, I want to share a little verse out of uh, it's, it's, um, Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. So Abraham takes Isaac up to the mountain, and he's getting ready to sacrifice him. He makes an altar. Isaac says, you know, where's the, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God himself will provide a sacrifice. But he lays Isaac on this, on this altar, and he ties him up, and he gets ready to do what God has told him to do. I don't know how he, do, he would do something. That, I don't think I could do it, just to be honest with you. But he's trusting, get this, Trusting the character of God. And then here's what an angel says as he gets ready to, to, to force the knife into his son's chest. He says, do not lay hold on the boy. Would you read this with me? Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. And here's what I want you to read. Everybody together. Here we go. Now I know that you... Let's stop right there. Now I know that you fear God. That's, that's, that's very important. And I'll go ahead and read the rest. Because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now, I, I want to talk about something real quickly and before we move on. We have lost something in our culture and the churches today that we need to get back. We have lost this because, or we've redefined it. We have lost, listen folks, the fear of God. And we say, well, all that just means I respect God. Well, it does, but it means a whole lot more than that. When you look up that word fear, it means to tremble before. And here's what it means. It means that I fear disobeying God, and I fear the consequences of disobeying God more than anything else. 
I fear disappointing God more than anyone else. And Abraham said, this was where his faith came in. Because remember this, you may want to write this down. The fear of God is the beginning, the fear of God is the beginning of faith in God. It all it begins there. Now, we use the term fear, and a lot of people, when we use the term fear, they, um, they, uh, uh, they think that, you know, when, when you say fear, that all fear is bad. All fear is wrong. Let me ask you this. Is it wrong to get angry and hurt somebody? Yeah, sure it is. But is anger wrong? All of it? Of course not. In fact, there's some good things that come out of anger. When somebody gets angry about something, I think mad, mothers against drunk driving. You know, they got, this lady got mad and she, she started an organization to do something that was constructive. So all our anger has got mad. Let me ask you this question and, and listen, follow through on this. Is discrimination bad? No. Now, if I discriminate because somebody of a, of a color of their skin or their, their economic position, or and that, that's wrong, obviously. But if I told you, if, you, if somebody said, would you allow your child to go play in this house over there where there's a convicted pedophile, would you let your child go? Because you would practice discrimination. Okay, so discrimination by itself isn't a bad thing. It's how it's used which makes it bad. Is fear bad? Some of it is. But let me tell you, if you're going to have, if I'm going to have a faith in God, it's because first I have a fear of God. Let me put it this way. I kind of wrote it down, and I want to read this to you. If I fear the consequences of disobeying God, then I will not fear the consequences of disappointing others. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. If I fear the consequences of disobeying God, then I will not fear the consequences of disappointing others. Some of us, we have all kinds of phobias. That's what I mean, fear, phobias, don't we? And God says you only need to have one. Because here's the truth. When I fear God, I don't have to fear anyone or anything else. When I, when I was a kid... You know, I love my dad dearly. I love him with all my heart. But I feared disobeying him. Because I knew that if I disobeyed my dad, who I love and got close to, but if I disobeyed my dad as a kid, that I would have to pay consequences I didn't want to pay. That's a healthy fear. I, I wanted my kids to have that healthy fear. Sometimes they did and sometimes they did But when we have a healthy fear, it helps God to create in us a healthy faith. Well, he goes on in James and he says this. He says, says, uh, and the scripture was fulfilled. It says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And read this last part with me. Now, because before you read it, you know what we say? Well, I can't fear God. I can't stand before God and be, be afraid. You know, it doesn't mean that we're afraid to talk to God. It means we fear the consequences of not obeying God. But notice what this guy who feared God, notice what it says about him. Let's read this again. Let's read where it says uh, Abraham believed God. Here we go. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness as he was what? Now, why was he called God? I thought he was afraid of God. You see, there's a difference, and we need to understand the fear of God. And he goes on to say this. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In other words, it, if they're trusting God, it's not by just saying I have a faith. It's by allowing that faith to live in and through me. And then he says this in verse 25. In the same way, and he uses another Old Testament uh, character. It says, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Now, you know, do you know the story about Rahab the prostitute? She's in Jericho and, and they're coming in, they're getting ready, Israel's getting ready to take over, you know, they're taking the whole, their land that God had given them. And, and when they, they sent some spies into the city and Rahab 
took these spies, these Israelite spies, and she, she hid them from her government, which could mean if they had found out that it would have been, you know, Rahab and her whole family would have lost their heads. It would have been a horrible thing for her. But she, she did this for a reason. And I want to read this text here. I believe it's in Joshua chapter 2. And I want to read this here. It's going to come on up here. Okay? And, and you don't need to read with me. Just kind of follow with me on this. Okay? Here's what it says in Joshua 2, starting with verse 9. I know that the Lord has given you this land and that, get this, this is what Rahab is saying, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So that all who live in this country are melting in what? Fear because of you. Okay? We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. In other words, we've heard the work and the power and the might of Almighty God on, on, on taking over these lands and how he brought you through out of Egypt. Now he's done some great things. And then he says, we've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did uh, to Sion and Og, these two kings of the Amorites east, of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, would you read this next part with me? Our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. Here we go. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Do you see what she was saying? She was saying, because we feared the consequences of God. That's why we're hiding these spies. And because she trusted the character of God, because she, by faith, trusted the character of God, God saved her and her family. And then the last verse in James says this. As the body... Would you read this with me? Here we go. As the body without the spirit is dead. Let's stop right there. Before you became a follower of Christ, here's where you were and here's where I was. We all were dead spiritually. The Bible says in Ephesians that we were dead in the trespasses of our sins. Okay? But when Jesus came into our life, theologians call this regeneration. In other words, we are brought to life. Our spirit, although our body may be doing functioning and alive and we're existing and you know, the soul has not been made alive yet. So when we give our lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into us, and this is what he does. He regenerates us or he makes us alive again. And so, he, and so James is saying this. He's saying, as the body without the spirit is dead, read the next part with me, would you? So faith without deeds is dead. In other words, if your faith isn't relying upon the character of, and the word and the power of God, your faith is just talk. Your faith is dead. Now, folks, listen. Here's one of our problems in the, in, in, as followers. We're not, pra- we're not allowing God to fill us with his faith so that we can rely on his character and rely on his word. Because you know, you know why? Because God sometimes will move us to do things that are just off the wall sometimes. Now, he's not going to have you sacrifice your kids or anything. That was a violation of the law. So he's not going to ask you to do anything like that. But are we willing to do whatever he asks us to do? Are we willing to give whatever he asks us to give? Are we willing to go wherever he asks us to go? Every time we go to Ethiopia, you know, uh, we, we had a couple guys go, Troy and Bill went last time, and you could tell those poor guys were just, was, before they went, you know, making the decision to go, those guys were just as nervous as they could. But you know what? Bill and Troy both said, God's telling me to go. God's telling me to go. And both of them said, I, I'll, I'll obey you, God, as much as I'm a little apprehens- apprehensive. Don't know if this is a good thing. Don't. And Bill, did it change your life? And it will change your, when you obey, not just go to Ethiopia, wherever he tells you to do. And sometimes the things he's going to tell you are not going to make sense, humanly speaking. 
but you got, but our, our place for folks is to say, I'm going to trust the character of God no matter what. When you do that and I do that, we become change agents for God. He can use us to make an impact for his kingdom. And some of you, listen, some of you that are believers, if you're not a believer, you're, you're saying, boy, I just need to become a believer, and that's true. If you, if you are a believer, the reason why you're so frustrated is because you're trying to live the life that God wants you to live in your own strength, wisdom, and power, and that, and that just doesn't work. Listen, I have become a, a victim of my own best thinking too long. You know? Have you ever, have, how many here, don't raise your hand, but how many have ever tried to do the work of God in your own power? I'm going to ask the Dr. Phil question. How's that working for you? That doesn't work. But when we, when we do the work of God, when we serve this incredible God, when we become, let me say it this way, when we become the work of God, our faith, you know, the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. Listen, because he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I, I heard a famous um, a famous uh, speaker was talking to a Muslim who had received Christ into his life. He came out of the Muslim religion, and he was asked to give his opinion on the Christians basically in America, or, or American Christians. And he, he says, well, let me draw two circles. So he draws two circles, and he puts a dot in the middle of these circles. Go ahead and put that up, Mike. Okay. Here's what he says. He says, when I look at Christians today, I see that here's their life. Just kind of all over the place. And here's their faith. He says, when I was in the Muslim faith, he said, this was their faith. And that dot represented their life, their wants, their desires, their dreams, their existence. He said, the Muslim guy who had converted to Christianity, became a believer, said, we've got something wrong in the Christian faith. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have what? Life and have it more abundantly. And most of us, and, and, and most of us are living in our own existence and we're not trusting God. And God says, that's why you're missing out. You're, you're trusting in your own best thinking. You're trusting in your own cultural standards. You're trusting in your own feelings and emotions, and you're not trusting in the, in the character of me, God says. Here's where we need to be, where our life is all about, and that's where I want to be. You know, I just tell you personally, this is where God kind of laid them up. I want to be here. And that, you know, all my desires and all my dreams and all my wants need to be like nothing. I want to be like John the Baptist who said that I might, dec that I might decrease so he would increase. While I was gone, I, um, I just prayed, God, what, what do you want to do in my life? You know, a few years ago I said, God, I'm, re I'm ready to resign and do whatever, uh, you know. He said, I don't want you to resign, I want you to follow me. He says, I want you to resign to yourself. And so here's the three things that God gave me the last two, three weeks. Um, first was that I'm just too stinking selfish. I'm just all about me. Most of us are. That's kind of our, it's in our DNA. It's kind of in our nature. We're kind of self-centered, aren't we? We want what's comfortable. We'll serve God as long as it's comfortable. We'll, we'll have faith in God as long as it's not too inconvenient. You know, and, I, and I wanted to say to God, I don't, not, listen, I'm not saying that you go out and just beat you. you know, there are people who beat themselves up and all. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I want to get rid of whatever I have of myself that gets in the way of Jesus Christ. Because, listen, how can I expect you to do that if I'm not doing it? can't how can i expect you to follow me as i follow christ if i'm not following christ and giving it all to him second thing that god said really in direct relation to that was just be obedient 
just do what I say without trying to figure it all out, without trying to rationalize it. You know what rationalize is? It's a rational lie, okay? <laughs> try to rationalize it, try to figure it out. Just believe me, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's going to cost you, and even when it's, you know, just doesn't feel right. Don't let your feelings be your guide. And the third thing was what I just shared with you a minute ago, that I need to under, re understand and I need to reaffirm the fact that I'm living under the fear of Almighty God, that I fear the consequences of disobeying Him more than I fear the rejection or consequences of disappointing somebody else. We need to live for an audience in one. Listen, folks, when we begin to live that kind of faith, we begin to really live life. The other we don't. We just trying to, we're trying to grasp God in our existence, and it doesn't work. But when we, when we say, God, I have faith in you. I am relying on your character. I am relying on your integrity. I am relying on your word. And I'm going to follow you no matter what anybody else thinks or what anybody else says or what anybody else does. I'm going to follow you. And when that begins to happen, God begins to be able to use us to make an impact on our family and our children now, you, you know, one reason why, you know, and, I, and I regret this, I want my kids to follow Jesus Christ fully, and they will not if I'm not. Even as an adult, they're watching, and your kids are watching you, and I made some big mistakes, and, I'm, and I repent, and I say, oh, God, please change my heart. But God wants to do something in you. Would you bow your heads with me? Maybe you're here today and you've never received Christ. And you feel a tug at your heart. You feel a pull of the Holy Spirit who's saying to you, come to me. And you need to receive him right now. With every head bowed and eyes closed. Um, say something like this to God. Say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for my sin. I repent. I turn away from my sin. And I receive Jesus Christ into my life. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. And now I can live in faith with Christ. In Jesus' name. Look at me if you would just a minute. If you prayed and received Christ. Your, your faith connected with God's faithfulness. You, 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 you felt the pull of God and you responded uh, with, with the, call, the calling upon God. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, shall be saved. And that was you. On, on a little communication stuff, I want you to check where it says, Today I received Christ. I want you to give it to Troy in the back and he'll give you a packet. Nobody will embarrass you. Nobody's going to question you. We just want to get some information into your hands. You're here today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Listen, you're a follower of Jesus Christ. But your faith is, you say, I just don't have enough faith. And you may not. You don't have to conjure it up. You don't have to try to pull it together. It's not by self-will. But what you have to do is to surrender your will. And say, you know, God, I want to listen to your voice. I want to read your word. God will always use his word to work in your heart to give you his will for your life. God says today, I want you to follow me. Here, here's the way I want to put it in my bottom line. Take a look at this. Faith is not just about what you believe. Faith is not just about what you do. But faith is about
your way. I'm going to follow you. I'm not going to try to do the work of God on my own. I'm going to allow the work of God to work through me, in me and through me. Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray. And if you need to come and just pray, this time of invitation for you, you can pray with these safe people up here. They would love to pray with you. If you don't know what it means to be a believer, come see them. Or you can pray here by yourself if you'd like. But if God's Spirit's moving on your heart, please don't just stand there. Move. And if you're not led to move, would you pray for those who need to come? Let's not say, okay, God, this is your time. I surrender these next moments to you. You do in me what you want to do. Father, I pray you'd work in your church as only you can. Move on the hearts of people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Won't you come? Lord, I come.